Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. they've got gearboxes. So, is 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 that the fastest you've ever been in a boat? Two forty four, or what did your GPS read? Did you like come out of there going two sixty, yeah. or you know, because no. sometimes you we've run that boat at two six, just over two sixty. Um, <laughs> we it went up to like when we went through there. I think it went up to like two forty eight. Yeah, you know, we're still accelerating, and I you can see the buoy pretty much so. You know, as soon as we'd done it, I backed off out of it, opened the wing and dumped, you know, I sort of opened the wing at the front, dumped the air out of it so it didn't rise up and do anything stupid. Mm -hmm. um, but we gave it one run at the lake, you know, but it was a real long, slow acceleration. And you don't, because their turbines are very smooth, you know, it's not like mm -hmm. a piston engine where it's all vibrating mm -hmm. and clanking <laughs> and banging. It's just like being on a plane. It just pushes and you go, you know, there's no yeah. real noise there. And where we tested it, it was absolutely mirror calm. And mm -hmm. you, 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 you didn't have a clue. It's just that you got, you know, there was stuff coming at you pretty fast. Yeah. Um, but it was a long, slow acceleration. It just kept building and building and building and building. I think yeah. the boat would probably safely probably go. Well, with that, that set up and the gear ratio and everything we run, it probably do 200 and, close to 280 but i think if we change gear ratio i think you could get it to you know close to 300 i would think <laughs> that's crazy I mean, it didn't feel what were the, uh, what were the out of control what were the horsepower uh, on each side for, for the they turbine were, engines they were about 3800 horsepower mm -hmm. each engine yeah it's it's one thing I've I've been pretty fast. I've been in the over the two hundred a few times. One thing I notice is the the sound of the air when you get going faster over the boat. The something so say that you go 140, 150, you don't feel like the air that you can hear going over the canopy it when you're going two hundred. It just kind of feels like the air's trying to pull it, you know opening yeah. hatches and stuff that you normally don't feel because the the vacuum or the air going over the or your hatch you know it's like a lot of the times they're you know that thick and not you know what they should be and yeah. they're like they'll start to chatter or something like that and you're like you could feel the air trying to pull hatches off and things like that yeah we worked a lot but, on safety of that boat and the hat everything yeah. was really tight so that boat was very quiet didn't squeak or anything so really? when you actually did Where, have it, running, is that boat still? Is it still around somewhere? Yeah, we've got a guy who's put some money into it and he wants to do something with it. He's got to finalize it. I think you'll, if the deal comes, I mean, the deal's meant to finalize this year. You'll you'll see it out again. We'll probably bring it out again to the Ozarks or wow. something. You know, that that's good cool. to hear. That'd, that'd, that'd be, be awesome. Cool. I mean, we got to do some setup on it and work out. You know, the best way to do three quarters of a mile. Like I yeah. said, I mean what. <laughs> It's just that 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 initial takeoff. I think almost a piston engine is better than a turbine engine for that. You know that, yeah. like you said, forty to one hundred is horrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And trying to break. I the tell you what, the, and... the turbines that I've been in, though, the smoothness, like you're saying about, is unbelievable. And then how how once the you do get the compressor and the power wheels all locked up like a torque converter in a car works. A man, yeah. it just sets you back. So I couldn't <laughs> imagine the power you felt. I felt like Dave's Dave's it, it was unfortunate that Dave had this great power and, and it was just a 44 MTI that wasn't enough boat for as fast as he's wanting to go. And uh, it was literally like you could go to 190, 200, just like that, but it would get a porpoise in it and you'd, you'd lift because of handling instead of, uh, because you're going too fast basically. And yeah. it was just the well, way we, that that boat fails when you, you're running a hundred or 120 and you just push the throttle forward. It's like, Oh my gosh, this is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> we did quite a lot of work on the bottom of it to even on the mystic, you know, which is a great high speed boat. Yeah. Which made it, bloody awful for turning but it made it very stable and once you got it up and running it almost had like a hook in it so when we first got going it would porpoise and be horrible but once you got it up and running you know mm -hmm. and it was all cleared out and you were using the power you didn't have an awful lot of lift in it and it would just mm -hmm. run super i mean just i mean literally you could let go at the wheel yeah and it was just fabulous like that you know it really really was it didn't completely come out of the water and want to 
keep yeah. climbing on you and you didn't have to That's give it cool. so much negative trim that you're running on the bow. You know, yeah. you could, you know, the attitude of it was very good. We spent quite a bit of time doing bottom work on that to get it at where we wanted it. Well, for us, you know, regular boaters, uh, you know, the 100 mile an hour mark was the the pinnacle. It was like, oh, wow, to, to do 100 miles an hour. To you, super boaters, I mean, do you guys remember what it was like when you first crested 200 miles an hour? Yeah, it was, I mean, you know, it's just, it's a number, really. It's really, because you can do 200 miles an hour in one boat and it feel like you're not moving. And you can do 200 miles an hour in another boat. Or 100 miles now in another boat, you feel like you're breaking the speed of light, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it, it's really how the boat's set up and handling. Um, but, yeah, I've been in some boats at 100 that scared the living daylights out of me. <laughs> and, I, you know, uh, you know, and you'd say, yeah. do you want another go in that? No, no, you're good. You're fine. I'll get in this 200 mile an hour thing over here and cruise yeah, around yeah. if you don't mind. So, oh, yeah, uh, yeah well, I, they... I think... You know, that, that big turbine boat at 200 was, I mean, was, you know, you'd let your grandmother drive it. I mean, yeah. it was just not a problem. Yeah. I've been in some V-Hiles at 70, and you were scared shitless, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I know there's a lot of times to where if a boat's a, a really good boat, and if you didn't know what propeller pitch and couldn't read the RPMs and they took a GPS away, you probably couldn't get, say you go out and run it, I don't think you could get within 10 miles an hour of what your real speed was. If you didn't, if you couldn't see attack, you didn't know your, uh, your, uh, prop. And then you just go out because there's no, it's not like you're counting seconds on telephone poles or anything. Cause there's usually yeah. nothing out there. So it's like, well, it feels like we're going 140, you know, but are we, yeah. we could be going 150, <laughs> you know, or so it'd, it'd be hard to tell, you know, and I've always wondered that. Took that away. You know, yeah. when we went from open cockpit boats to canopy boats, when we first got in it, you know, when you first got in the canopy boat, it was like, well, we're we moving, you know, what's going on here? You know, you really yeah. didn't think you were moving at all. You know, yeah. you've got a, like you said, if you've got a good boat, you haven't got a clue. Yeah. Yeah. And well, one of the things I remember when we were a good boat and you you say you're you're trying to like bend it around a, a buoy or something you're like man that buoy just went by fast you know you're like <laughs> we're really rolling you know that that's yeah, like the whoa. best feeling ever yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it clocked in on it yeah for sure yeah well, well the industry was, steve yeah go ahead Myra. well i was gonna say I, I i think it's i mean i didn't i knew you were into motorcycles i didn't know that you were you know uh, a 125 European champion at one time, but then you know the for you and Travis Pastrana to be in the boat together had to be kind of you know you talk motorcycles and things like that. I mean, obviously he's a crazy man, and I've had a few conversations <laughs> with him, and he's always super nice and always you know just like excited to be there and excited to be boat racing. So what's it like to be in the boat with him? I mean, obviously he's talented in anything that he gets in, whether he's jumping out of a plane or freaking, uh, doing the, uh, <laughs> rally cars and all that stuff. So, uh, what, what's it like, uh, especially since you guys have the same, uh, history in motorcycles and then getting in a boat together. Yeah, he's, he is number one. He's a su super, super nice guy. And, you know, when I first met him, I thought, I wonder, you know, it's like an act or whatever, but you know, as I got to know him more and more, it's not that he's just, a genuinely nice guy that likes to race anything and ha happens to be a bit unhinged, to be quite honest, yeah. because <laughs> he's beat to death. I mean, he's, I mean, his knees just had knee replacement surgery. I mean, he turned up at one of the races, I think it was Cocoa Beach a couple of years ago, and his knee's the size of a basketball. You know, oh, it'll be all right. I don't know if he doesn't feel any pain or whatever. I'd have been laid up for a year and a half, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, and he's just, a natural talent you know he got in the boat you know obviously there's a few things that's different and he but he concentrates really hard you know he's got this very laid-back attitude but he works at it you know and we look at the data afterwards and he says oh this is you know oh, i think we could go faster into it like that and i said well this is what we did and then we would try that and oh, okay i get why that doesn't work and stuff so very talented guy you um now we've done a few races. Obviously, he made a few, you know, rookie mistakes. But, I mean, 
once he's got his line, very much like motocross, he's on it. You know, he's just bang, 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 bang. We did a couple of races together. And, you know, he, he's, he's just, he is spot on. He's a very, very good driver. Um, and, I, and like you said, I think he's like that in anything. You know, he's one of these guys that just has got the feel for the machinery, um, which is he's not – I don't think he's super mechanically minded. Like, you know, a lot of throttle men, you know, were mechanics or, you know, we, we get on this thing, big, you know, us – you know, we're not the owner drivers, we're the, 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 the worker, yeah, throttle mental drivers <laughs> or whatever, you know. So we get we're paid earning, for, we're earning, uh, earning our keep, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we're earning our rides, as it were. Um, and but he's got he understands what when he's in the cockpit, like you know, I understand gear ratios and props and what that does, you know, faster spinning propellers, small diamond, bigger diamond. He doesn't understand that, but he certainly understands, you know, when you come back and you put a smaller runner on what it feels like or whatever. And yes, oh, yeah, I can feel that. I can feel that. So very smart guy, um, which I think people underestimate him for um, because of his really laid back attitude, and, you know, crazy. But you give him a piece of equipment, he can feel it. You know, he can tell mm-hmm. you, give you great feedback. And he, you know, you're not going to scare the dude, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, and he'll, and he'll, he'll be super reactive. So if he gets himself in a mess, he'll really try and drive his way out of it. Cause I think he, he gets in so many different things that, you know, he, he needs to work out how he can get out of a situation. So, he's, mm-hmm. you know, he doesn't give up. He doesn't go, Oh shit. What do I do? You know, take yeah. his hands off the wheel, which I've seen, you know, he gets yeah. into it, he'll whip it back. He'll, you know, do whatever he can and say, Oh, why, you know, and if we do something, why did we do that? Whatever. So, yeah. You know, he's a great guy, you know, super happy to be raised with, you know, and obviously, you know, he's all of our heroes because some of the crazy stuff that he does, you know, we'd all, you know, I'd love to be able to do a double backflip on a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, in my day, it was lucky if we got airborne and, you know, took a leg off the peg or, <laughs> and if we did, it was by accident. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I've got to get that thing back on there. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, I have to pick it up with my hand. So, yeah, I mean, and he, you know, and like I said, he's a great guy, he's a family guy, you know, and, and I think what he's done for the, you know, he's helped us with the sport. You know, it's fantastic. He's given us a yeah, lot of huge. You know, what he's done for the sport of offshore is great. You know, a lot of people recognize it. You know? Yeah, Steve. To your point, I, I think it was the same Cocoa Beach race. He was in a boot, and he had a, a flock of fans in front of him asking for his autograph, and he he signed every single autograph that that was asked of him. And uh, afterwards, I'm like, "Oh, hey, can I grab?" He's like, "Give me a second. I have to piss so bad." <laughs> he like <Yeah>. waited <laughs> and, and yeah. took off and and uh, had to use the restroom, and then came back and then and talked to me. So it's just super super nice guy. Yeah, I and, watch. I watch that video of him jumping out of an airplane without a uh, 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 a parachute on. I bet. I bet you. I've watched it thirty times. Like, it's yeah. just look insane, at this yeah. nut job acting like he's <laughs> sleeping. Then, oh, I wake up. Just jumps right out of there. I was like, I couldn't even jump out of an airplane with a parachute on, let alone you know, do do I, that. I have trouble jumping out of bed in the morning nowadays. So I don't know. <laughs> jump out of a helicopter or plane, you know. So uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very cool. You know, funny enough, I had some friends of mine. He just did the Formula Extreme out in Saudi Arabia, yes. and I got some friends who are in, involved in it. You know, and they, and um, in fact, Deborah T, who does a lot of marketing and PR for different companies, <laughs> she went up to him and said, "Oh, you know, you know, I, you know, I know Steve and stuff like that." So they had a chat, and she came back and she said. He was the nicest guy, you know. I went up to him and just sort of said, "Hi, how you doing?" And you know, I'm, you know, I know Steve and stuff. That she said, I had a half an hour conversation with him. He's just a, just a nice guy. He's got time for everybody. I've never ever seen him not have time for anybody. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Which is great in his situation because he's one of the only recognizable um, motorsports people in the world. I mean, he walks through everywhere you go with him. Everyone recognizes. Him. Yeah, yeah, you know, for he, sure. You know, it's cool and super nice guy. Yeah. Well, speaking that, of uh, uh, nice guy that you've shared the cockpit with, uh, this this guy right here, big bad Bob, Bob Kaiser. Kaiser. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, you guys go way back. Yeah, 
I've known Bob for, yeah, a long time. <clears throat> we were racing in 85 against each other in class one. That was my first year. And he had a boat with GK Systems. I think he was racing with a guy called Red Crane out of Michigan. And um, <clears throat> anyway, we got it. I guess, what is he? You know, four or five years older than me. So he, he you know, he was kind of a big, doofy kind of dude, you know, and he was always hanging around <laughs> and stuff like that. And um, I think it was a year before, actually, he had a, he had a, I don't know, another boat. Anyway, so I got talking to him. I met him one time. And, like, the next time I saw him, he brought me a pair of shoes with checkered flags on them because I'd won a race. And he, you oh, know, he's like, I said, oh, that's cool. So, yeah. we were, anyway, I got to know him and stuff, and we ended up being friends. And we, you know, it was a lot more social back then, I'd say. So, everyone would show up on the fi- Thursday, they'd go out Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You know, it was like <laughs> a big thing. So, there was like a big group of us that always used to hang out together. And, you know, I was part of that group. He was part of it, you know, the Seahawk guys. And, all these, you know, Copeland and, you know, but you'd go out en masse. You'd take over, you know, whole nightclubs and restaurants and whatever. So <clears throat> we got, you know, we got to be really good friends and we, we stayed good friends. You know, he married a, you know, a girl that I knew really well, a French girl and stuff. And, and you know, like we, you, we just stayed friends over the years. You know, we've been on holiday together and, party in the south of france together he did a few races in europe and stayed at my house a couple of times so yeah he's a a true lifelong friend and you know one of my yeah one of my greatest friends to be honest with you that's cool well i mean so last few years at the boyne thunder run you guys have have run his boats together you on the throttles and him driving and it's become like a tradition now that you guys pair up and run his boat uh, in the Boyne Thunder Poker Run. Yeah, it's um, yeah, we did it the first year. I think when he first got his forty-eight, and um, we ended up. Yeah, he said, "Would I come up and do it?" And I said, "Well, what do you need me to do it for?" You know, and he said, "Oh, come up, come up." And I, I you know, I had such a good time. Um, not only the events cool, but it, it, it it's nice because it's very easy. You know, when you've got families and stuff to grow away from doing things like that, you go, oh, the kids have got to, you know, play soccer or rugby or whatever, you know, and, you know, Harper's going horse riding and stuff like that. <clears throat> and it's, um, and I didn't see Bob for quite a few years because I was in Europe and stuff like that. And to be honest, it was the first year I thought, oh, I wonder why I want to see me and I really should be doing this. And then I did it and it was brilliant and he invited me back the next year. You know, it's kind of invited me back. You know, I've done it like three years now. And, Every year we've had so much fun. The weather's been fantastic, so we've had great boating. Um, but Bobby's just hilarious to hang out with. I mean, he just, yeah. I mean, he's super generous. He's a super nice guy. Like I said, one of my best friends in the world. I'd do anything for him. Um, yeah. You know, him and Tanya. And, you know, well, you know you've been with him, Ray, and stuff. He's just fun. It's all about enjoying yourself and, right. you know, He's, he's another genuine, generous, nice, nice guy. There's not many of them like him, that's for sure. Yeah. That's cool. Well, I, I'm leading this into, so the two of you have found his old uh, Cougar Systems race boat that you're currently restoring. Can you yeah. tell us about that? Yeah. Um, we, we, you know, Bobby, you know, when he did, most of the winning that he did was in, a, in, in the Systems boat, which was in a 38 foot aluminum Cougar. And we tried to find, find it and they found it but it had been partly um, rebuilt done some work on it and it was in california and um basically we we couldn't get hold of it you know errol tried to find it errol in there who used to throttle for him and all these people tried to find it in the meantime we found one of the sister ships to it which was spirit of america which i think a guy called john antonelli owned or something like that and um he used to race it with hurley step and so we found that one, and it was a sister ship, and he raced against it. So we said, right, we'll start this one. So I got it over to my shop, started to look at it, and then he said, no, no, don't do that. I found the other one. So I said, oh, I'll get the other one. I want my original boat. I said, all right, fair enough. So I've still got the old boat, which they've got a different deck on it, but it's sat there. So I was like, all right. So we got it back to the shop, and it was in a lot worse condition than I thought it was, um, to be honest with you. Um, but, yeah, we're putting it together. Um, we're going to put Mercury 865s in it. Um, 
I think, you know, that'd be good power for it. We're going to put, make it like it was with the open cockpit. We're going to put four seats in it instead of two. Um, so you can take people out for rides. We're going to do it so you can control it from one side or put another steering wheel on the other side and throttle and drive it. So we're going to do a few things to it. Um, paint it up exactly like it was because he had systems written down the side and gold leaf. And, you know, it was a yeah. fabulous, you know, all of his stuff was absolutely immaculate. I believe he's found his own, his old workshop. It's like a flat nosed Kenworth with a workshop on the back of it. Oh, that's cool. It. <laughs> and he, he had a trailer that he used to put a, he had a Corvette on the front of it. And I think he's going to get a, a C8, I think it is. And, you know, and put that on the front <laughs> of the trailer as well. So it'd be just like it was. Um, so we start to restore it, but it's, you know, it's a lot of work. Um, like I said, more work than I thought, but you know what? He, you know, it's going to be a great thing for him. It's going to be, you know, he deserves it. He's a great guy. And he did, you know, he did really well in that boat, but he beat the living daylights out of it, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I think we're going to make it a nice job. It's up um, North Carolina at the moment, at being all bead blasted down and we put new deck panels on it and building new cockpits for it and that sort of thing. But I so think when it's going to be lovely. When you're fastening things on an aluminum boat do you use rivets or do you weld it or do you obviously probably both yeah depending on what you're doing but if you're doing like the decks and stuff it's all you know on the thicker panels which are on the bottom it's all welded on the mm -hmm. deck it's a lot of riveting and such like um you know all the all the cockpit and stuff's all riveted together and a lot of bending panels and stuff like that um wow. but it's 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 you know we're going to get it all painted and we're gonna you know get the the bulk of the work done so all the aluminium work's done and you know the tanks are in and the drives are you know basically worked out where we're gonna put it and then we're gonna bring it down to errol's you know put his last touches on it you know errol's just had a birthday actually he's 84 years old but it'd be nice to get really? you know errol involved in it and, yeah you know it was a big part we, we of that. just had a we just had an LCB come into the shop and uh it's it's a pretty cool little boat, little twenty footer. And uh yeah. I'm 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 excited when that thing's done. I want to go for a ride in one. I've yeah, never you, been in cool. one. You wanna put a few spray rails on it, get a bit more lift out of it. We've done one down here and light oh, yeah. that thing right up. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> the uh one of the things I was thinking about also, uh so how did your dad learn how to do what you know, starting Cougar boats or being part, I don't know if you started, but being part of Cougar boats, uh, you know, what, what was your dad's background to be a boat guy? Oh, my dad. What was your dad's name? What was your dad's name? Clive Curtis. Clive. Yeah. And he started Cougar Marine with a guy called James Beard, um, and Chris yeah. Hodges. Um, and my father used to have a, a, a like a Chandrally stroke, where they sold boats, Owen's boats in, in, um, in London, in Putney, which is South London, actually. Um, and they, he, there was another guy called Jeff Tober who also had another boat company and they started outboard racing in the UK, offshore outboard racing. So they, um, but they were standard boats over from America, actually fiberglass boats, you know, they had like those tops on them and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that they'd do a race, and in a, I think Dad raced in a fourteen foot six um, Owens with like a ninety horsepower V four Johnson. He went from London the whole way up the Thames, Thames, the whole way down the south coast uh, to uh, to um, I guess it was almost yeah Brighton sort of way dope, and then across to France, turned around and came back. And it's like I don't know two hundred and fifty miles or something. He did that how, long did it how long did it take him? Oh, like six hours or like seven oh, hours. I mean, it took them a long time. They didn't stop. You know, got there and they had to, in those days, they had to get a bottle of champagne from this certain restaurant, bring it back, take it back to the boat. They had to fuel up. They had all these cans and come back. And he won the first race. And I think it was in 1962 or something. I don't know. I mean, it was, yeah. it was you know, a fairly long time ago. And he started a club called Ucopa, Ucoba, which is, United Kingdom Offshore Powerboat Association or something. And that's really where powerboat racing started, offshore powerboat racing started in the UK. Um, I think there might have been the Cows Talk. He might have done one or two at that point. And then he had some other boats, which he raced. And um, then he started circuit racing. 
and he had a boat designed by Sonny Levy, which they bought. It was double diag wooden, and it's, they flattened it out, and it's called Hummingbird. And they built that with Chris Hodges and James Beard to race it, you know, because they couldn't find one, a standard one. And they put a different deck on it and stuff. And I've got the boat now. I bought the boat out of a scrapyard oh, really? years ago, and I think they raced it in 1969 or something. Um, um, and that was when he started to build boats. Um, that's when they, that was the first Cougar boat. So I've, I've got that boat. It's all stored at my um, at, um, the place in Orlando. Um, like, fantastic little boat. Um, and um, <clears throat> that, um, then he got into building circuit boats. They were still in London at the time, a lot of tunnel boats. Um, came over, he was a factory OMC driver, which is Johnson and Evan Root. And they sent him over to the, um, to race in the, they had a race which was um, on Lake Havasu, was it Havasu? Under London Bridge. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so they had got that race up there and it was like a six hour race or something. And they had, you know, hundreds of outboard boats racing in it and he raced for OMC stuff and started to build more boats and stuff like that. And was building his own boats and building them for other people. Then they started in class three, which is like a super stock boat, you know, with single engine outboards, twin engine outboards with catamarans. And most of the boats at that time were V bottoms in the UK. And they built um, a bunch of catamarans, you know, which were kind of crazy looking now. But what's quite impressive is we, they sat in the sponsons and they had a big wing and like all the super stock boats come down to nothing at the back now. And that's exactly mm -hmm. how those boats look, you know, and they twin outboards on it and stuff. And he built those. And then he built a class two boat um, um, for a guy called Keith Dallas, which won the world championships. And that was called Penthouse Rizzler. Um, and then and went over to Key West and raced and did very well. I think it won its class over there um, with four outboard engines on the back. And then he sold a wooden one to a guy called Ken Casier called Yellow Drama. Um, and that won the Cows Torquay in 1977. And then that really set it off. They sold that to, um, I think, Paul Clouser, Satisfaction, or Rocky Oki, Benny Hanna, one or the other bought it. Maybe Rocky yeah. bought it first. Um, so they raced that, and that, that was when the cats started to come into America because it had always been, you know, the cigarettes and the scarabs and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. then the wooden boats started to get a bit old and fall apart, and then we started with the aluminium boats. And we never really got in on the big boats. We never really got into the fiberglass boats, to be honest. And that was probably a mistake. We probably should have followed up on technology there. Um, but at that point, um, I was racing. Dad was, you know, getting a bit bored, I guess, of building boats. We were building a lot of pleasure boats at that time, a lot of military boats, a lot of bigger boats. Um, <clears throat> Dad um got a little bit ill at one stage and i stopped racing for a few years he got you know he was diabetic and you know wasn't very well um and our dad a lot of the 70 percent of the company was owned by tolman group and they went bust basically and sort of dragged cougar down a little bit with it um so we we, we still sort of kept cougar going we still did design work consultancy work um but, you know, it wasn't like it was at one stage. It was, you know, when Dad had it all running, it was flat out. And I probably, you know, should I have worked at it more and got into it? But I was too busy being, a, you know, young and racing and enjoying myself. And yeah. that was the direction getting, getting to tra Getting to travel and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, you, 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 know, you live for the day and stuff and, you know, it was, at that stage, it was, you know, it was a playboy lifestyle, to be honest with you, a private jet net air there and everywhere and mm -hmm. partying. And, you know, it was, it was fantastic. Um, you know, if, if it was now and, you know, my dad passed away a few years ago, you know, um, I, I, you know, if, if now I'd go straight into the company and, you know, get involved. In yeah. it, but, it, you know, it's not there to do, unfortunately. But I, I don't yeah. regret, you know, carrying on racing because I've enjoyed it. And at the time, you know, I had the conversation with dad, you know, and whether we, you know, we saw, you know, whether I stopped racing and go into it <coughs> or whether I carried on racing at that point, he said, look, are you, you know, you're enjoying it. You're having fun. He said, look, you're never going to be a multimillionaire out of it. He said, but Hey, if you're enjoying it, go with it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. That's great. That's cool. 
And uh, so I think I'm right about this. And I don't know exactly how to say it. Are you Sir Steve Curtis? Or (laughs) isn't there something going on like that? Yeah, Yeah, there was a rumor. Is he or isn't he? I got into NBE, which is a member of the British Empire. And it's the same. It's like a a lower thing than a sir but you get recognized by the queen i went up to the palace you get you know you go through all the rigmarole you dress up and you you know you meet her and shake her hand and she gives you a medal and all that sort of stuff you oh get, that's cool you that's know great. And, and it was a brilliant you know it was we're good at that in england you know pomp and ceremony and stuff like that and it's, <laughs> having it's, a good time <laughs> yeah it, it was pretty freaking cool and it was you know, I had a party afterwards at the Royal Motor Yacht Club, which is a big club in the centre of London. Um, you know, and it was great that my dad was there, my mum was there, and you know, and I think it was good for the sport for sure in the UK. Yeah. Um, you know, boosted my ego no end. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, awesome. But but it, yeah, it was. Yeah, hey, look, it was really cool. It, it was you know, I was honoured and humbled by it to be honest with you. And look. You know, I think, yeah, like I said, it was great for the sport. And, you know, it was when I, I guess, was at my prime and a lot was happening, the sport was at its prime. And, yeah, it was super. I mean, it was, it's a cool thing. And, you know, I've always been a bit of a royalist. I always thought she was cool. And I like the idea yeah. of us yeah. having, you know, a royal family, et cetera. Um, yeah. And the, um, the history, so the, his, the his, history behind it and all that. And, yeah, yeah. that's, that's really cool. You know, so you technically, you are Sir Steve Curtis? Well, I'm not a sir, but I'm a you know a member of the British Empire. <laughs> that's good. that's Gothic awesome. Cap to me and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> do I have to do I have to bow now every no, time no, I see you? <laughs> the most time I see you, you're falling over anyway. It's kind of like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got that right. So what's what's next for Steve Curtis? Um, I got a couple of things going on. I mean, we I haven't sorted out what I'm doing this year racing wise. I've got a few projects that I'm working on. Um, you know, I've got to get Bob's boat together. Um, not that I'm doing too much of the physical work on it, but, you know, I'm overseeing it, shall we say. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's one project I can't really talk about. I'd love to stay in racing. I mean, uh, one of the problems I feel with our sport is that when people stop racing, they just walk away from it. It's like it didn't exist. And you kind of lose that, you know, that effort to push it forward a little bit more. So, I, especially with the Class 1 team, you know, where it's meant to be a little bit more um, of a business type thing, I'd like to stay involved in it somehow. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm working at that. I'm working at a project with that. Um, but I'm also working on a, a commercial project. I'm working on another project where it's a, a thing that I've been working on for years and years and years where it. It's basically a huge ship that picks up the trash in the ocean, um, and it's oh, wow. um, and it's also it, it picks up trash, burns it, and it produces electricity to run the whole thing. It's a, wow. I mean, it's it's a project that I was working on with Pete, Peter Cummington, who you know was my business partner for a long time, um, and I we, we you know we're talking to some people about funding, but it's really a I don't know. I've always I like the ocean. I think. You know, we've got trash all over it. It's not, certainly not awful in America. It's not awful in the UK. You go to China, India, they're dumping it out. They're like, there's no tomorrow. You know, they don't care about it. But it's, you know, there's these huge areas, islands of trash in the middle of the ocean that, you know, this could pick up, burn. And the only, and it doesn't, you know, it burns at such a high temperature, there's no, nothing that goes up into the atmosphere. It's completely, you know, carbon neutral. The only byproduct of it is ash. Which you know you can put in the water, and it's there's nothing that lives down there anyway. It just floats just down. Just dissipates. It's like, it, yeah. yeah, it's like sand. <clears throat> in fact, if you can bring it back, you can use it for like a concrete dust sort of thing. You know, mix it. You know, like a filler. Um, but so you know, I'm working on that. Um, I'd love to see that come to something. Um, and uh, one other project that I'm working on. So we'll see. You know, I, I don't ever want to give up working. I think that's a mistake. I think you, you know. And saying that, but I've always loved what I've done. So it, it, it's easy to say that. I guess if I was, you know, stuck behind a desk trying to work out how to put this 
app on my computer i'd give yeah, it up in a yeah. second but um <laughs> yeah but you know because i've always loved what i do i, I could never imagine not working and you know i can never really ma- imagine not being around powerboat racing one way or another you know even if i came down and watched it or whatever um you know you never feel like you know you're too old to do it um i think um maybe at a certain level i probably couldn't do it but the the beauty of powerboat racing is you can decide at what level you want to do it you know if i want to go and race you know that's the beauty of racing in like cows there's historic classes there's when you go over there there's some boats which are 40 50 years old racing and they're immaculate you know the old cigarettes came a dry martini you know so maybe yeah. get one of my old race boats and do a couple of things like that but um yeah i got plenty to do you know i've got you know abby and the kids at home you know max now is 14 and six foot tall um so you know he likes <laughs> rugby and stuff so he's you know he's doing a lot and i miss them i'd like to see them a bit more um because i have spent a lot of time you know that's one of the disadvantages of doing what i've done you know i've been away from the family a lot you know when you when you do get to see them it's great quality time but i'm not there every day you know which i'd like to be you know harper my daughter's a lunatic um and she's um she's lots of fun to be around and stuff and so yeah i, I think that whatever i do hopefully this year i can back it off spend a bit more time in the in the uk anyway once i've got a few of these things sorted yeah well, Steve, I mean, you're you're a true ambassador to the sport, and uh, it's always fun and exciting watching you race. You know, uh, what is it, Marek, win or swim? And <laughs> do you, <laughs> is is that your your motto to this day? Uh, Would you, you say? Know, I I like winning. I can't, you know, I wouldn't get <laughs> in a boat unless I didn't think I could win. Um, you know, my old motto used to be "When in doubt, air it out." Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think. You know, I I think if there's a chance that I can win, I'll I'll, I'll push it hard enough to win. Um, I think you know, obviously, I'm I'm not I'm not as crazy as I used to be. I'm a bit more of a thinker. Isn't, think about the season. Isn't, than... isn't that funny how that works? I was I was always I've always told Ray I'm like, you know, you notice that I mean not not for you, Steve, because you started pretty young, but most of the drivers and throttle men are in their thirties by the time they get a chance to get a ride, you know, because if you were to put me in one of these boats when I was 20, it, I was going to crash it every, you know, every turn <laughs> because there was zero fear at 20, but then you get to be 30 and you're like, eh, I'm going to take a little easier here, you know, cause but it's just, it's wild how it works to where you, you think about it more, I guess. Yeah, and I think you think about the championship, you think, you know, you've got more knowledge. So you say, look, I'm not going to be, I can't beat that boat, you know, so I might yeah. as well sit back here and if they make a mistake, I'm going to get by, they break or whatever, yeah. you know, you're more of a thinker. Whereas, like you said, when you're 20, you're like, I don't care. I'm yeah. five miles in the lead. It's not far <laughs> enough. I want to win this by 10 miles. You know, yeah. Boom. Yeah. You know yeah. so it's, yeah, you do think about it a little bit. I mean, I'm, when I race motorcycles, we used to have this thing called the girling leap. And you got a prize for the longest jump on this thing. Like every every time a bike went by, they used to, you know, see where it landed. I had to win that. I mean, there was just no question. I mean, and I remember I was like third in the race, and third was a good position for me. And I remember going off the berm so I could get a longer run up. You know, sort of leaning over the back, <laughs> taking the thing wide, there, nailing it. Two bikes went by me. I went by them just absolutely having hit this jump. Landed, broke the forks off the thing, <laughs> cracked <laughs> like an idiot. And I was riding for Suzuki at the time, and the 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 guy who was like the team manager mechanic guy came over, and I was only I don't know fourteen or something, and he just <laughs> abused me. I'd never heard an angry guy. Oh, I'm sorry. You know? Yeah. <laughs> But, you yeah. went from you went from third to last, but did, oh, yeah, did yeah. you get the, did you get the longest jump? Oh yeah, <laughs> 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 got the trophy too. <laughs> Hell, yeah. Hero to zero. <laughs> Hero to zero. <laughs> that's great. But yeah, oh, so I, awesome. I, yeah, I think I, and I, now. I just got the jump and go over it. So things happen. Yeah. yeah. And take your third place. Yeah. It's really happy with third. 
<laughs> well, Steve, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, man, it's been an hour and a half and uh, it's just flown by. So thank you yeah. for your time and thanks for uh, sticking with the, the setup process. Uh, <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Testing you, but... All right. Great to see you guys, man. I really appreciate great it. Great to see you and look forward to seeing you around the pits, even though you're not racing technically for a team. Uh, but I'm sure you'll be around as the ambassador. You never sure. know. You never know. You, right. you never yeah. know. <laughs> He's got stuff up his sleeve. <laughs> All right, guys, you take it. So easy. this has been another episode of the Boats and Bros podcast with Steve Curtis and my bro Myra Coyle. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like, rate, follow, share, and subscribe, and tune in for the next episode. And thank you again, Sir Steve Curtis. <laughs> <laughs>